Let's talk about the book of Joshua. This is the history of the conquest of the promised land under the leadership of Joshua. It is a religious epic. It includes lists of cities and boundaries from the time of the early monarchy. This book derives its title from the name of its hero, Joshua, Yushashua, that means Yahweh is salvation. Joshua was the former assistant of Moses and his successor. Joshua was the man who led Israel in the conquest of the promised land. Let us talk about the content of the book. First, it talks about the ancient traditions connected with religious shrines like those of Gilgal and Shechem. It involves etheological stories such as popular stories explaining the origin and meaning of places and customs. And finally, it presents lists of cities and boundaries related to the different tribes of Israel. In its present form, the Book of Joshua is a religious epic, an enthusiastic narration and exaltation of the fulfillment of God's promise to give Israel a homeland. To give us a short background of the book, the book appears to be the continuation of the book of Deuteronomy in spite of its different style. It takes up the story of Israel where Deuteronomy left it, with the Israelites in the plains of Moab, facing the land of Canaan, soon after the death of Moses. Joshua who had been designated and anointed by Yahweh himself, will lead the people into the promised land. The attribution of all victories to Joshua is explained by the fact that he was not only the most outstanding personality and leader, but actually, he was the God-chosen successor of Moses. It was just natural and accepted that he should be presented as the privileged instrument of God's victories over the enemies of his people. What is the religious message of the book? First, we discover that Yahweh is the great protagonist in this book. He is the great strategist and the constant winner. He accomplishes the conquest of Canaan for the Israelites through Joshua, just as he had set them free from Egypt through Moses. He is always faithful to his promises. He settles his people in Canaan in fulfillment of the promise he had made to Abraham and which he had reiterated to Moses several times. But the preservation of the gift of the land depends on Israel's faithfulness to the covenant. Let us talk about the highlights of the story of Joshua. Let us start with the order to enter the promised land my servant Moses is dead. So prepare to cross the Jordan here, with all the people into the land I will give the Israelites. Then, the crossing of Jordan this is how you will know that there is a living God in your midst, who at your approach will dispossess the Canaanites. And also the Passover in the promised land, while the Israelites were encamped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, they celebrated the Passover on the evening of the 14th of the month. The first renewal of the covenant at Shechem there, in the presence of the Israelites, Joshua inscribed upon the stones a copy of the law which Moses had written. Joshua proceeded to read the words of blessing and curse, and all that was written in the book of the law. And lastly, the second renewal of the covenant at Shechem Joshua gathered together all the tribes of Israel at Shechem, called their elders, leaders, judges and challenged them, if it does not please you to serve the Lord, decide today whom you will serve. In response to Joshua's challenge, the people replied, far be it from us to forsake the Lord for the service of other gods. For it was the Lord who brought us out of the land of Egypt, out of slavery, performed miracles, and protected us along our entire journey. We will serve the Lord. Let us talk about the Book of Judges. This book is a compilation of popular traditions about the consolidation of the conquest of the promised land and the feats of the charismatic leaders sent by the Lord to protect his people. It supplements the contents of the Book of Joshua. The title of this book comes from the twelve heroes or judges whose deeds were remarkable. What are the judges by the way? The term judges is not to be understood as one who administers justice in an ordinary law court. Rather, it means a person who is an instrument of God's justice in liberating his people from oppression. The original Hebrew term is shopet which can be translated as leader, champion, or deliverer. Who wrote this book? The Hebrew tradition attributed this book to Samuel. 
But an attentive reading of the text reveals that the Book of Judges owes its existence to several people who compiled and edited the popular traditions of each tribe about the conquest of the territory assigned to them. This work of compiling, editing, and re-editing started after the fall of the Northern Kingdom and lasted for several centuries. The final redaction of the book appears to have taken place sometime after the return from the exile, in the 5th century BC. Subsequently, an editor of the Deuteronomic school arranged the material of this compilation according to the framework typical of theological schools, namely, first, faithfulness to Yahweh, and the covenant brings happiness and prosperity, and secondly, unfaithfulness causes suffering of all kinds. Specifically, the book of Judges follows this pattern, sin, then, punishment followed by repentance, and lastly the deliverance. Talking about sin, some tribes or the whole nation of Israel turn away from Yahweh, and give themselves to idolatry, imitating their pagan neighbors. As a punishment, Yahweh allows Israel's enemies to oppress and exploit them. And as a repentance, the Israelites acknowledge their sin and plead for Yahweh's saving intervention. Deliverance tells us that Yahweh raises up a man, or a woman, who will be the instrument of his saving intervention. Let us have a glimpse of the historical background of this book. The book of Joshua ends with the impression that most of the promised land was securely possessed by the different tribes of Israel, and the Canaanites were totally defeated and subjugated. The book of Judges does not simply inform us about what happened during the 170 years that elapsed between the death of Joshua and the establishment of the monarchy. It actually yields a totally different picture of the situation of the land of Canaan and the relationship among the different tribes of Israel. In reality, Canaan had still to be conquered. The original inhabitants, the pagan Canaanites, were still very much in control of the better portions of the land. The Israelites had settled in poor areas and were continually exposed to the negative influence and the arrogance of the local rulers. The Israelites were also harassed by the Philistines, who had likewise invaded the land and occupied the coastal area. Moreover, a certain spirit of independence was creeping into the way of life of the twelve tribes. Each tribe tried to establish itself in its own area, and only occasionally did it join forces with the other tribes to fight a common enemy. The only things in common they had were, first, the remembrance of Yahweh's intervention in their behalf at the time of their liberation from Egypt. Second, their worship of Yahweh as the God of their fathers. And lastly, the awareness that each tribe descended from Jacob and therefore, its members were expected to show solidarity among themselves and toward the other tribes. The Book of Judges deals with the period that followed the entry of the tribes of Israel into Canaan under the leadership of Joshua. However, it also partly overlaps with the period covered by the book of Joshua. It also narrates the conquest of Canaan, emphasizing the shortcomings of the Israelites and God's faithfulness to the promise of a homeland made to Abraham. It shows that the conquest of Canaan was not a series of swift victories, but a gradual and long process which would be completed only with the monarchy. The book gives its religious message such as, divine providence rules man's history. The instances of punishment and deliverance mentioned in the book are clearly the work of God. God brings about his plan through human agents. He punishes Israel through its enemies and delivers them through the judges. God's instruments of salvation are inadequate to fulfill their mission. If they succeed, it is only because of God's special assistance. Sin is the root of suffering and national calamities. Conversion from sin and humble prayer to God are conditions for peace and lasting prosperity. Here are some details, let us see. The grim cycle of unfaithfulness and punishment. The land was already apportioned to the twelve tribes. It was up to the twelve tribes to conquer it fully, uproot idolatry and establish a society that responded to the demands of the covenant that they had made with Yahweh. But something else happened. The Israelites abandoned Yahweh and served other gods, the gods of the neighboring people.
As a consequence, Yahweh got angry with his people, so he gave them into the hands of the plunderers who left them in misery. This caused much distress and anguish for the Israelites. The Judges, God's Instrument of Salvation From the bottom of their despair, the Israelites recognized their sins and pleaded for mercy. Then, Yahweh raised up judges or liberators who saved Israelites from their exploiters. Unfortunately, when a judge died, the people became worse than their fathers, worshipping and serving other gods. They would not renounce their pagan practices and stubborn ways. And so Yahweh abandoned them once again into the hands of their enemies. Not forever though, for he loved his people, and all that he wanted was their conversion and rehabilitation. Let us get to know the twelve judges. They were the men and women sent by Yahweh on a special mission. The judges raised up by the Lord to defend the oppressed tribes of Israel did not fulfill their mission consecutively, nor was their action extended to all the twelve tribes. Some of them were contemporaries. Their activity usually covers only one tribe, or just a few. The twelve judges are grouped into two categories, the major and minor categories. The distinction is based on the importance of their victories and the length of their stories. The Twelve Judges Let us begin with the major judges. We have Othniel from the tribe of Judah. He defeated Kashanrishathan, king of Aram, and peace reigned for forty years. We also have Ehud from the tribe of Benjamin. He attacked Englon, king of Moab. Then we have Deborah and Barak from the tribes of Ephraim and Naphtali. They delivered Israel from the oppression of Yavin, king of Canaan with his army commander, Sisera. Another one is Gideon from the tribe of Manasseh. He rescued Israel from Midianites was reinforced by the tribes of Naphtali and Ephraim. Next is Jephthah from the tribe of Reuben. He was asked to return to fight against Philistines and the Ammonites. He ruled as judge for six years. And who can forget Samson? He is from the tribe of Dan. In Hebrew, his name is Shimshon, perhaps connected with Shemesh, meaning son, and the divine name Shamash. He was the son of Manoah who lived in Zorah, Shephelah. Samson was the only long-term planned judge of Israel. His birth was announced by an angel to his mother who was barren, a divine election and prediction. The story of Gideon and Samson are the highlights of the book of Judges. Let us start with the call of Gideon. Again the Israelites sinned against Yahweh, and he gave them up to the power of the Midianites for seven years. For fear of the Midianites, the Israelites sought shelter in caves, while their crops were plundered and destroyed by their enemies. They cried out to Yahweh, and the reply was not late in the coming. The Great Victory Against the Midianites Strengthened by the Lord's encouragement, Gideon started by smashing the altar of Baal and erected a new altar in honor of Yahweh. With Yahweh on their side, victory was assured. Who was Samson? He was raised as a Nazarite. He was a weapon which Yahweh gave to the tribe of Dan to fight against the Philistines. A Nazarite is a person consecrated to God in a special way, such as, to keep the promises, not to drink alcohol, cut his hair, go near a dead body. Did Samson keep these promises? Sad to say, no. Simply because Delilah came in. Delilah. Who was she? What is she to do with Samson? The name Delilah is probably derived from either, Dala, meaning to behave in an amorous manner, or Delilah, meaning a guile, or a betrayer. Delilah became the mistress of Samson. She betrayed him by handing him over to the Philistines. Here's the story, let's begin with the capture of Samson. Samson revealed to Delilah that the secret source of his strength was his uncut hair as a Nazarite. Delilah cut his hair so the Philistines were able to capture him and gouged out his eyes. The Death of Samson The Philistines thought that they had subdued Samson forever. On a feast day of their god, Dagon, they brought Samson to the temple where thousands of them assembled, and made fun of him. Samson cried out to Yahweh and said, Lord, please remember me and restore my strength, and let me die with the Philistines. He grasped the two pillars upon which the roof of the temple rested, and pushed with all his strength. The roof collapsed, killing all the people in the temple.
Those who joined Samson in his own death were more than those he had killed during his lifetime. How about the minor judges? Who were they? We have, Shamgar, the son of Anath. He was sent to save Israel by killing 600 Philistines with an ox goad. Another one is Tola, the son of Pua, from the tribe of Isaacar. He lived at Shamir, mountain of Ephraim. Was a judge for 23 years. We also have Jair, from the tribe of Manasseh. He had 30 sons who rode on 30 asses and had 30 cities. Was a judge for 22 years. Ibzan is also in the list. He is from the tribe of Judah. He had 30 sons and 30 daughters. Succeeded Jephthah and was a judge for 7 years. Elon is in. He is from the tribe of Zebulun. He was a judge for 10 years. And lastly, we have Abdon. From the tribe of Ephraim. He was a judge for 8 years. These were the men who became instruments of God's care for his people. Let's talk about the book of Ruth. This book narrates some events that took place at the time of the judges. It was written to show that King David, the forefather of the Messiah, was the descendant of a Moabite or non-Jewish woman. This shows that God is with all those who follow him, even though they are not physical descendants of Abraham. This foreshadows the universality of salvation. Here is how it started. First, during the period of the Judges, Elimelech migrated to Moab with his wife Naomi, and his two sons Malan and Chilion. Elimelech died in Moab, and his two sons married two Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. The two sons died. Naomi wished to return to Bethlehem. So she said to her daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you to your mother's house. May Yahweh be kind to you and grant you rest in the house of another husband. Then Orpah kissed Naomi goodbye and returned to her own family. But Ruth said, I will go wherever you go and stay wherever you stay. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, there will I die and be buried. The rest of the book is the love story of Ruth and Boaz, a rich landowner. Naomi urged Ruth to seek married with him. Significant messages of the book. The story shows the heroism of two women which arises from unswerving, committed faith and trust in Yahweh. Yahweh is protector of widows and rewarder of fidelity. Ruth is just one example of a non-Jew in the OT, who was blessed by God. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus mentioned the widows of Zarephath, and Naaman as other foreigners, who were equally blessed by the Lord. Why? Because God's love is for all, regardless of race and nation. What are the highlights in the book of Ruth? Chapter 2 verses 1 to 4 presented the origin of our liturgical greeting, The Lord be with you. Chapter 4 verses 18 to 22 is on the genealogy of David. The genealogy of David. This, then, is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Ammonadab, Ammonadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, Boaz is the father of Obed, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David. This time, let's have the first and second books of Samuel. The twelve tribes of Israel become one king under kings chosen by the monarchy and of royal messianism. This is to note how David becomes the recipient of the very important promise that his dynasty will last forever. And of course, the name Samuel comes from the Hebrew Shemuel, meaning, name of El, or his name is El. Who is Samuel by the way? Samuel is the son of Elkanah of the tribe of Ephraim. He was a leader of Israel at the time when the tribal confederacy became a monarchy. Let me tell you about the books of Samuel and their development. 1st and 2nd Samuel were originally one scroll, which was later divided into two books. 
These books describe the end of the period of judges and the beginning of the monarchy in Israel under Saul and David. It is not a complete and continuous history, but a series of episodes centered around the persons of Samuel, Saul, and David leading to the establishment of the royal dynasty of David. These episodes were first put into written form during the reign of Solomon to prove the legitimacy of the dynasty of David, and the legitimacy of the succession of Solomon. They were re-edited during the reign of Hezekiah and finally revised by the Deuteronomist to introduce the reign of Solomon. Just a little historical background. The organization of the nation Israel changed when the monarchy was established. The history of Samson, Eli, Samuel recounts the unceasing attempts of the leaders of Israel to liberate the Israelites from the oppression of the Philistines. But all those attempts were in vain. The Israelites became weary of their experiences of oppression and longed to have their own independence and king, like the Moabites and the Edomites. The book of the first Samuel records the establishment of Israel's monarchy and its continuation in the dynasty of David, the dynasty from which the Messiah would be born. Let me tell you more about Samuel, as a child, he had been placed by his parents in the temple of Shiloh and entrusted to the care of Eli, a revered priest who ministered in that shrine. One night, Samuel heard a mysterious voice calling him by name three times. Eventually the boy understood that the Lord was calling him. Speak Lord, your servant is listening. Gradually, all Israel came to know that Samuel was a prophet, and Samuel spoke to all Israel. He grew to be the most revered spiritual authority of his time. The purpose of 1 Samuel basically is to explain the beginning of the monarchy in Israel, the legitimacy of the Davidic dynasty, and Israel's faith in the messianic role of that dynasty. How did the monarchy begin? The elders of Israel clamored for a king to rule and govern them. Give us a king to rule over us like the other nations. We need someone to organize us and build an army. Samuel was opposed to the demand of the elders for a king because he thought that his would break the covenant of the kingship of Yahweh over Israel. Through God's guidance, Samuel eventually acceded to the elders' demands, but on condition that, God would remain the only true king of Israel. First, the human king must only be a representative of God to his people. And secondly, the human king must be subject to the Mosaic law, admonitions, and guidance of God's prophets in working out the nation's ultimate destiny. God ordered Samuel to anoint Saul as the first king of Israel. Unfortunately, Saul failed. Why? Because Saul did not subject his own ambition to God's demands. So he was rejected and became an example of a human king who failed to live up to God's expectations and demands. The Book of the Second Samuel The Book of the Second Samuel records the beginning of David's kingship and the history of Israel under his reign. What happened after the death of Saul? After the disaster of Saul, almost everyone felt relieved. Then the people of Judah anointed David as their king. The name David, which in Hebrew, David, means beloved. He was the son of Jesse from Bethlehem. He had already been chosen by God and anointed king secretly by Samuel when he was but a boy. He had been introduced to Saul as a musician. Later he became his arm bearer. He became an instant hero when he slew Goliath with his sling and a stone. But that was also the beginning of his troubles. Full of envy, Saul tried to kill him. David has to flee for his life. After the death of Saul, David defeated the Philistines many times. Eventually, he was acknowledged king of Israel. The people of Israel loved him. As a king, unlike Saul, David followed God's will. He understood that only God is the true king of Israel. He subjected to God's covenant and allowed himself to be guided by the inspired prophets. Let me tell you more about David. David is described as a shepherd, a young boy tending the flock, an image of the perfect king who attends to the needs of his people. As a poet, he is a composer of psalms. His poetic compositions were the fruit of his reflections and of his dramatic experiences. As a soldier, he is a military hero. A brilliant commander who captured Jerusalem and defeated the Philistines.
As a king, he made Jerusalem not only his residence where he built his palace, but also the religious center of Israel. He was an ideal king because he did better than anyone else what a king was expected to do. He united Israel, but above all, David was much more than another king because, Yahweh had promised him, I will make your royal throne last forever. But at a certain point David and his kingdom were nearly destroyed. This was because of his sins. What sins? First, adultery with Bathsheba, and then, the murder of Uriah, Bathsheba's husband. Enlightened by the prophet Nathan, about the gravity of his sins, David acknowledged his faults and prayed. O oh, wash me more and more from my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. My offenses truly I know them, against you, you alone, I have sinned, what is evil in your sight I have done. David committed also another sin, sin of pride when he ordered a census of all the people. When he realized the wrong done, David said to the Lord, I have sinned grievously in what I have done, forgive the guilt of your servant. God offered David three alternatives to choose from as a punishment for his latest sins. First, three years of famine for the whole nation, second, to flee from his enemy for three months, third, three days of pestilence in the land. David answered, Let us fall by the hand of God, for he is most merciful, but let me not fall by the hand of men. David chose three days of pestilence. Let us have now the books of Kings, the first and second Kings. These books present the religious and political history of Israel over a period of four centuries, from the last day of David to the destruction of Jerusalem, around 587 BC, and the Babylonian captivity, exile in Babylon. The books of Kings were originally one single historical work. They cover the period between the reign of Solomon and the destruction of Jerusalem. The temple, which is the chosen place of worship, is central to the books of Kings. What is the literary form of the books of Kings? Well, they are religious epic. Allow me to give you the historical context of the book. The first and second Samuel record the beginning of the monarchy in Israel and the foundation of the Davidic dynasty, guaranteed by God's promise of perpetuity. But the facts of history were not hopeful for its realization. Why? Simply because, in 922 BC, the ten northern tribes rebelled and set up an independent kingdom. Israel was torn into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom of Israel, with Samaria as the capital, and the southern kingdom of Judah, has Jerusalem as their capital. In 722 BC, Samaria was captured by Shalmaneser V, and the ten tribes of Israel were dispersed by the Assyrians throughout their empire and never returned. In 587 BC, the Babylonians, under the command of Nebuchadnezzar, destroyed the walls of Jerusalem, burned the temple, and razed it to the ground. The best of the Judeans were deported to Babylon. Consequently, the protection promised by God in the Sinai Covenant seemed not to have been realized. The temple about which God had said, My name shall be there, was burned and razed to the ground. The 400-year-old rule of the Davidic dynasty, to which God had promised perpetuity, ended. The Jewish exiles questioned, how could God be said to be faithful to his covenant promises? How could Israel believe the divine promises that the Davidic dynasty would last forever? What was the purpose of the final editor of these books? First is to instruct and convince the exiles by demonstrating that Israel, through her kings, had been unfaithful to the covenant, and that God, far from being unfaithful to his part of the covenant, had remained faithful and patient with erring Israel. And secondly, to elicit from them acts of repentance for their past sins, and to renew their hopes for the future.
but above all, these books were written to answer the distressing questions raised by the events of 587 BC. What is the message of these books? Number 1, the catastrophe has overtaken Israel, because of the infidelity of the kings and the whole people to the covenant and to the temple. Not because of any lack of fidelity on God's part. And number 2, it was the word of God through Moses that brought Israel into existence at Sinai. It was the word of God through his prophets that shaped Israel history through centuries. So, once God has spoken his words will be fulfilled infallibly. And lastly, the promise made to David of a perpetual dynasty is a promise and a prediction that must be fulfilled. But because of the historical circumstances of the editor's time, the nation destroyed, the Israelites exiled, the king deposed, he could not point to the fulfillment of this promise. The First and Second Chronicles Record the long period from the reign of Saul to the return of the exiles. They demonstrate God's intervention in history. Second Chronicles ends with the good news that the Jews are allowed to go back to their own country and rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. The historical background of the books. Chronicler realized that the Jewish people saw their political greatness as a thing of the past. He defended the Davidic monarchy and emphasized the Jerusalem temple as the center of the religious life of the Jewish community. Characteristics of the book First and Second Chronicles are Midrashic history composed and compiled from existing written documents and oral traditions proper to priests and Levites, for the purpose of encouraging the people. The emphasis is on A. The Messianic Hopes of Israel, based on the promise made to David in Samuel 7 colon 11 16. B. The ecclesiastical nature of the nation based on the continuance of the temple worship. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah. The story of the two persons responsible for the reorganization of the Jewish community after the return from the exile. The historical background. The prophecies of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Deutero-Isaiah about the end of the exile became a reality in the year 539 BC. The Persian Emperor Cyrus the Great defeated the Babylonians and established the Persian Empire. He decreed the return and re-establishment of the Jews in their own homeland and the construction of Jerusalem. Upon the arrival in Jerusalem, the Jews were so discouraged and disillusioned at seeing the situation of their homeland. The land was devastated and stripped of everything. The temple was razed to the ground. Community life was paralyzed because of the economic and political problems. What was their political problem? The nation was surrounded by the hostile Samaritans in the north and by the unfriendly Edomites in the south. What are these books about? The books of Ezra and Nehemiah are about the history of restoration. They narrate the return from the exile, and the religious and political reorganization of the Jewish nation. The Book of Tobit The Book of Tobit is named after its principal hero. It is a combination of Jewish piety, morality, and oriental folklore. This book is a religious novel written in Haggadic Midrash. Haggadic Midrash is a type of writing that elaborates and builds upon some historical events or character to provide instruction and edification. The story of Tobit gives us two lessons. First, the love of God and neighbor. To put our trust in God as a loving father and in his providence. And second, to live the kind of life God wants to perfection. The Book of Judith <laughs>
book narrates how God delivered the Jewish people through a woman. It is an edifying narrative on divine providence. Judith, in Greek, Iodith, meaning Jewess, is the heroine of the book. The book of Judith is one of the Deuterocanonicals. The book is a vivid story of how God delivered the Jewish people through the leadership of a woman. The book is not a history as viewed by modern historians. It is Midrashic history. Midrashic history is an account based on some semblance of a historical nucleus, but freely elaborated for the purpose of instruction and edification. The Book of Esther It develops the principle of reversal fortune, such as the punishment of the oppressor, and the reward for the oppressed virtuous. The book explains the origin, significance, and date of the Feast of Purim. The book is named after its Jewish heroine, Esther. Its content is for religious edification, but is historical in substance. This book was written for the consolation of the people of Israel, to remind them of God's watchful providence. God will never abandon them, if they will serve Him faithfully, and go back to Him in sincere repentance. What about the theme of the book? The theme of the book is the glorification of the Jewish people. It also explains the origin and significance of the Feast of Purim. The Feast of Purim, this is the feast that commemorates the reversal of the lot of destruction of the Jews with one of deliverance and triumph. First and Second Maccabees The first Maccabees portrays God as the eternal benefactor of the Jews, and their source of unfailing help. In response, the Israelites have to worship Yahweh in the temple, and to observe the law. This book recounts the history of the Maccabean Wars from 175 to 134 BC. The purpose of this book was to emphasize the decisive role of God in the salvation of His people even when this was brought about through human agents. It was also to encourage His own countrymen to be faithful to the law, and to their religious traditions. The second Maccabees gives the theological interpretation of the historical events. It also contains the teachings on the resurrection of the body, and of the living praying for the dead. The book supplements the first book of Maccabees. The two books of Maccabees deal with the glorious history of Israel's resistance, under the inspiring leadership of the first Hasmoneans, to the religious persecution unleashed by Antiochus IV Epiphanes. In 167 BC, the old priest Metathias and his five sons rose in revolt against the Seleucid king Antiochus IV Epiphanes, who forced the Jews to adopt the lifestyle of the pagans. The books derive their names from Judas Maccabeus, meaning hammer, or the designated one, the most famous son of Metathias. The book visualizes God as close at hand, ready to answer the prayers of his chosen people. It stresses the doctrine of the resurrection from death the intercession of the saints, the prayer of the living for the dead, confident faith, optimistic hope and sincere love of God.